it, it's worth noticing like, okay, what do we build a lot of today in the United States? We build a lot of wind and solar and combustion. Those are all things that are centrally manufactured. You know, we basically print them in a factory and then we staple them to the ground. That's a lot easier than building a giant concrete civil works project with thousands of on-site people that need to be found, trained, hired, relocated, housed. Really, really complicated. That's Matt Slotkin, the founder of nuclear startup Blue Energy. On today's episode and next week's, we're talking to founders like Matt, who have seen the big problems with nuclear and are building companies designed to address them. We'll also hear from the investors who are backing them. We wanted to kick off this episode with Matt because he's building almost exactly what Nick Torrance said was one of his favorite ideas in episode three. My other favorite idea is to build a, a factory of large reactors, a shipyard factory. That's a really interesting idea. And like, if we wanted to get really serious about decarbonizing quickly, that's the kind of thing we should be looking into. It's like bringing Henry Ford factory production at shipyard scale to floating reactors. Many people do want to get really serious about decarbonizing quickly. So what's Matt building to do it? And our approach is to basically centrally manufacture them in shipyards, um, the entire power plant manufacturing in the shipyard, where you already have a pre-existing labor force, you already have the equipment. This ends up being a, a near shore, like a, an offshore nuclear power plant. There's a lot of benefits to a nuclear power plant being in the water instead of on land. Matt is bringing Nick's dream idea to life. Build reactors in shipyards and float them offshore. We'll dive into a lot more detail with Matt in a little bit, but how cool is that? Julia, I have to admit, this season has been a roller coaster for me. After our conversations for episode three, I was pretty close to convinced that we just needed big companies to start building more large reactors with government support, maybe even some central planning, and that maybe nuclear was just a category that didn't really make sense for startups, except in some edge cases. There's no doubt that we need to get better at building large scale nuclear plants, put gigawatts and gigawatts on the grid. But I was beginning to think that that was the only viable path forward. And then we talked to the founders and they brought me right back. The founders building nuclear startups are betting that by starting with a fresh sheet of paper, they can radically improve how nuclear energy production works by improving the reactors themselves or the size and form factor. As far as the reactors themselves go, some founders are rethinking some of the key components, such as the cooling methodology or fuel type, to make them more passively safe or more efficient in fuel use, for example. Others aim to rework the reactor design only slightly to make them more manufacturable. And finally, some are sizing down reactors significantly so they can serve off-grid locations where today, diesel generators are the sole source of power. While there is a lot of excitement about the potential for these new models, not everyone believes this is the answer to building more nuclear. They are probably wise not to deem these our silver bullet, as much is still unproven. Some founders, like Isaiah Taylor of Valor Atomics, whose great-grandfather worked on the Manhattan Project, are less concerned about what exact design we're using or what size we're building. We just need to bring the cost of building way down. We shouldn't simply aim to match China on the cost of building large-scale nuclear plants. We should tap into the entrepreneurial spirit that moves America forward and build better, cheaper, and faster. There's a couple ways we can sanity check ourselves. One is that China is doing this about seven or eight times cheaper than we are. So that's just a really obvious one. Like how are other countries with completely separate regulatory frameworks doing this? And China's doing it about seven or eight times cheaper. So there's just a sanity check off the surface that's like, okay, we're doing it very wrong. But even China is doing this based on like old technology that frankly they've stolen and is you know, 15, 20, even 30 years out of date from how we know to build nuclear reactors very cheaply. So even you know, old technology, old build patterns are seven or eight times cheaper when you just do them in a different regulatory framework. The bet nuclear fission startups are making is that even though nuclear fission is a 70-year-old technology, we can build it better today. The term first principles thinking has become a cliche in tech, but it's a really useful way to approach building things. It means breaking down complex problems into their most basic fundamental elements and then reassembling from the ground up. Talking to the founders got me so fired up, and I think that's why. We heard a bunch of variations of, well, the laws of physics say it's possible to do this much better, so let's use them as our starting point. The founders we spoke with are working on a number of different approaches, as Julia mentioned, from the ground up, different designs, fuel types, sizes, and more. 
But broadly, we can put them into two categories. One, manufacturing. Take existing approved designs, but manufacture them instead of constructing them on site to make them cheaper over time. And two, advanced reactors. Create new reactor designs that come with built-in advantages and open up new use cases for nuclear. Originally, we were just going to do one episode for founders, but after talking to them, we realized there was too much to fit into just one episode. So we're splitting it in two, along those two lines. Today, we're talking to the founders focused on taking existing designs, scaling them down maybe with some tweaks, and manufacturing them. Next episode, we'll talk to people building advanced reactors with new designs beyond pressurized water reactors. There's some overlap to be sure. Some of the companies working on advanced reactors or serving off-grid uses are also rethinking how to build nuclear more efficiently, and we'll include some of their thoughts today. We'll also talk to the investors backing some of these ambitious, if off-the-beaten-venture path startups to get a sense for how they think about investing in such atoms and capital-intensive companies. For today's episode, it's time to manufacture. We've talked about this idea of experience curves or learning curves a few times, and it's particularly relevant here. Experience curves describe how unit costs decline as cumulative production increases. And it's often captured by something called Wright's Law, which is like a Moore's Law for manufacturing based on production. In 1936, an aerospace engineer, assistant MIT professor, and administrator named Theodore Paul Wright noticed something while working as the director of the Curtis Wright Corporation. Every time the company doubled its airplane production, the cost of each plane decreased by a fixed percentage. That observation, which would be named Wright's Law, held across industries from semiconductors to cars to consumer electronics to batteries, and most pertinently, to renewable energy like solar and wind. The chart you see that shows the precipitous decline in the price of solar and wind is the result of those technologies' experience curves. Simply put, the more units of a product you manufacture, the cheaper each unit becomes. But nuclear, as we've discussed, has largely been constructed, not manufactured, and certainly not mass manufactured. The thesis behind SMRs is that since they are smaller and built more modularly, they are able to be mass manufactured and can thus move away from the tyranny of bespoke construction projects. When we spoke to Mark Nelson, he made fun of me because I used the joke term that he used, which is a large modular reactor. But there's also a point there, right? Aren't the AP1000s, like the core is manufactured. It's just that you have to take it on site and build it and build things around it. And so it turns it maybe more like on balance into a construction project. Are there differences besides size or is it really like, if it's just smaller, you can do more of it in the manufacturing facility and do less construction? A lot of it is size, and I think, you know, some people give the whole SMR movement a little bit of a hard time, right, for being a little bit of a marketing ploy. <laughs> uh, it's like, hey, it's this whole brand new thing. Um, yes, largely they are just much smaller. Um, but the other thing about manufacturing things that are smaller is that you can do them more scalably. Think about having to manufacture something that's just massive uh, and the type of machinery you'd need for it. Like the bigger it is, the more sort of bespoke it does feel even in a factory setting. Um, or if you're thinking small, like you're really printing them out. So there's something to be said for smaller just being more conducive to manufacturability overall. I think it's actually, it's kind of smart that people are saying, well, you know, we have these large but more modular reactors than the initial ones. I think, to your point though, when you need to bring a very large reactor core into what is, you know, the rest of it is basically a construction project, on net it becomes a construction project. And the real challenge for SMRs is going to be, can you really have them come off the production line and just put them on a truck, drop it somewhere and have it turn on? Or, or do you actually, will you end up needing to construct shielding or other safety features around it? And so time will tell how much these SMRs do look on net to be much less like a construction project than these large reactors. When it comes to thinking about how to manufacture nuclear capacity, we went deep with three founders doing just that. One, Matt Slotkin of Blue Energy, a nuclear integrator licensing other companies' reactor designs and utilizing shipbuilding factories to build floating nuclear power plants. The second one is Brett Kugelmas of Last Energy, who's building 20 megawatt small modular reactors using tried and true pressurized water reactor designs. And the third one is Isaiah Taylor of Valor Atomics, who wants to use nuclear to cheaply produce hydrocarbons. Matt and Brett are working with existing designs. 
pressurized water reactors and working to scale their production. Isaiah is taking a new approach and selling into a different market, but his thoughts on manufacturing were so helpful to my understanding and I think our understanding that we decided to include him in both episodes. Each of them is taking a wildly different approach to manufacturing nuclear, but one thing they have in common is that they're looking outside of the nuclear industry for inspiration. Instead of viewing nuclear reactors as some special class of particularly difficult to build thing, they view them as just another pretty hard to build thing. On the last episode, we basically tried to answer the question, given how the nuclear industry works, what can we change to speed up and cost down what we currently do in order to build more nuclear? But Matt, Brett, and Isaiah are asking a different question. Given that we want to build a big, complex machine, which industries do that best that we can steal ideas from? In other words, what can we take from the industries that benefit from experience curves in order to put nuclear on that same trajectory? So first things first, how far off are we on cost compared to those other industries? What kind of opportunity does manufacturing nuclear plants and factories present? Isaiah breaks this down as simply as possible. So um, I did an interesting project on this when I was evaluating whether or not I should start Valor. And just forecasting into the future, I wanted to know like, all right, if we could actually operate this thing at scale, if we could be bringing nuclear reactors off the assembly line and installing them into this hydrocarbon production grid, like what's the actual cost of that? What could we get that down to? What I did is I looked at a bunch of other industries that create large, complex pieces of machinery. And I tried to give them a general t-shirt size of like, how much does this thing cost? And I used a, a kind of a funny metric that you might laugh at, but I think I found it quite useful. And I said, let's just take the volume of an industrial piece of equipment. Let's say a large diesel generator, a combine, a bus, um, a semi-truck. And what's the volume and what's the sale price? All right. So like the dumbest metric that we can think of, but you could apply it across an extremely large range uh, of industrial machinery. Well, it turns out like no matter how complex and complicated and small scale of a thing that you're building in like the industrial manufacturing world, things generally fall between like $500 to $10,000 per cubic meter. So if you want a cubic meter of industrial machine, if that thing is like super dense and complicated, it's going to be like $10,000 per cubic meter. If it's, you know, sort of more sparse and less complicated, something like a combine tractor, it's like $500. The highest I could possibly find outside the, the world of nuclear uh, is the Falcon 9 rocket, which is about $50,000 per cubic meter. All right. So there's like the super, super broad, you know, envelope of, of things that are manufactured. If you try to do that with something like a new, you know, nuclear power plant, you're looking into like the 500,000 to $2 million per cubic meter. So, you know, it, it's almost not even worth looking at, you know, how can we make this process more efficient or like, how can we bring the costs down? You actually need to like clear the slate and say, how do you actually manufacture these um, and how do you manufacture them for the right customer with the right target in a way that allows you to use more traditional, normal manufacturing processes to get more inside that like, you know, 500 to $10,000 per cubic meter envelope. Did you catch that? A nuclear power plant, which uses a practically free physical reaction to heat up water to spin a turbine, costs 10 to 40 times more per cubic meter than a Falcon 9 rocket. Isaiah suggested that the difference between construction, building things bespoke on site without repeated processes or automation, and manufacturing, building things repeatedly in a factory, often with the help of automation, are so huge that efficiencies and cost cutting don't really matter as long as you can move from construction to manufacturing in the first place. That's one of the big bets that this batch of nuclear startups is making that by building the same thing over and over again, by printing out nuclear reactors, as Matt puts it, you can dramatically lower their costs. You can bring them in line with other things that we manufacture and draw lessons from hundreds of years of manufacturing experience in those industries. And to be clear, the concept of manufacturing reactors isn't new. Isaiah told us that the first thing a lot of people realize when they get into nuclear is that we should probably be manufacturing reactors. Nick Torin highlighted that the NRC actually granted a license for shipyard nuclear manufacturing back in 1982. SMRs are not a new idea, but the concept itself is only part of the story. Last Energy and Blue Energy get to start with that fresh sheet of paper and craft a strategy that incorporates the lessons from previous attempts. So they're a perfect lens through which to look at the opportunity in manufacturing nuclear reactors today. And like Matt, Brett at Last Energy is looking less to earlier SMR companies and more to other industries for inspiration. 
So in our early like rollout, it's going to be best practices from like offshore oil and gas platforms, where what they do is they put an extremely high premium on labor in the field because they are in the field is like out on an ocean platform. And so, you know, given the historical record of nuclear companies, most of the money gets spent from like construction, you know, mess ups and delays in schedule and high, you know, interest rates on your construction loan. We go after that, like very intensely. And so, yeah, we treat it as if it's an offshore platform and we say, we will do anything, pay almost anything to minimize skilled trade labor in the field. Um, so that comes from like offshore oil and gas first and foremost. And then as we begin to level up in terms of our throughput, that's when we're going to transition more to airplane manufacturing techniques. And then even beyond that into automotive manufacturing techniques. Brett says he will pay almost anything to minimize skilled trade labor in the field because the difference in cost between construction, skilled trade labor in the field, and manufacturing, non-skilled labor that is efficiently used is so high that it's worth it to invest more in manufacturing to do as little construction on site as possible. What's amazing is that we heard versions of this same idea from Brett, Isaiah, and Matt. When all three noticed the same thing, we paid attention. Here's Isaiah. I think the trade-offs that generally happen in, in uh, manufacturing processes, like autonomous processes, or even in nuclear, tend to focus, focus a lot on like heat efficiency. And they focus on heat efficiency at the expense of manufacturability. So if you can squeeze like a couple percent of heat efficiency out of a process, but there's like another human in that process, or that tank is like a weird shape that's hard to manufacture, that's a trade-off that generally happens. I'm on the complete opposite side, which is like, I'm willing to lose points in heat efficiency if this thing is like 10 times easier to manufacture. So there's the opportunity. If you can manufacture reactors and minimize on-site construction as much as possible, these entrepreneurs believe that you can make nuclear so cheap that you don't even need to sweat little efficiency gains until you're further down the experience curve. But how do you build a company around that idea? Nuclear is hard, manufacturing is hard, venture capital is more typically used to start software companies. The best way to understand how smart founders are thinking about building hard nuclear manufacturing startups is to hear how they've thought through the problems themselves. To be clear, again, there's no guarantee that they'll succeed, and we'll discuss some of the challenges later in this episode and in the next one. But for now, let's have Matt and Brett walk us through how they decided to enter the fray and how they plan to win. The path Blue Energy's Matt Slotkin took to nuclear is straight out of Trey Stevens and Marky Wagner's Choose Good Quests. After spending time at Bridgewater and founding a successful software startup, he asked himself, what are the most important problems? What are the problems I'm working on? and how to explain the difference. In that journey, he realized that he'd accumulated the skills and resources to do something really big. And after exploring a few industries, he landed on nuclear. In the intro to the episode, Matt said, the question was, what are the big problems and what's the best way to solve it? And the answer he came to was one you're probably familiar with at this point in the season. The biggest problems with uh, nuclear today is it's a terrible business. So to me, like that was the big challenge is how do you make it more attractive? And part of that is standardization, right? Like every time we build a nuclear power plant in the United States, it's a different group of people in a different place, you know, with different requirements and constraints and environmental factors and permitting. Um, it becomes very difficult to finance. So I think if we made it easy to finance, easy to regulate and um, straightforward for the, both of those things to happen, I think we'd actually be able to uh, bring it down the curve. It, it's worth noticing, like, okay, what do we build a lot of today in the United States? We build a lot of wind and solar and uh, combustion. Those are all things that are centrally manufactured. You know, we basically print them in a factory and then we staple them to the ground. That's a lot easier than building uh, a giant concrete, you know, civil works project with thousands of uh, on-site people that need to be found, trained, hired, relocated, housed, Really, really complicated. So Matt and his co-founder, Jake Jurowitz, analyzed the nuclear industry and spent hundreds of hours talking to people and visiting plants. They came up with two core challenges that need to be balanced. One is it has to be something that someone will buy. Um, so that's like that construction and manufacturing challenge. And the other thing is it has to be something that can be regulated. That's the other challenge, right? And, and I think that actually a lot of nuclear projects, or maybe every nuclear project, is a bet on a balance between those two things. The advanced reactor groups, I think they bet that, you know, if they 
kind of build some of these new advanced reactors. They'll convince people that it, you know, it's unproven regulatorily, but that, but they think that they think, look, that'll be such a good business case because it'll be much cheaper, and we'll we'll prove that it's so safe, and so that's the bet we're going to take. You know, inversely, there's you know the incumbents that are you know saying, look, this regulatory process is so burdensome and difficult. We're going to build what we know how to build. Yes, it has a lot of challenges, but it's the only thing that's worked so far. And I think that you know. Right now, there really isn't a big success story, at least in the nuclear startup world or the fission world, and I think that's because that balance has yet to be proven. Like, like no bet has been proven correct on that balance. So, to us, we tried to you know look at that balance. How do we take the fewest risks on both sides of that and try to build something that we think strikes the right balance there? And so, from the regulatory side, you know, the idea was okay. Well, we don't want to. Design a reactor. We don't want to invent a reactor. We don't want to use anything the NRC doesn't already understand. A lot of nuclear startups, by the way, have looked at the NRC and have said we're going to go elsewhere. We're going to go to other countries because you know that's less burdensome. That's a different problem where they don't necessarily have the infrastructure to do the regulation, and that hasn't really panned out in a lot of cases. So you know we want to be in the United States. We want to use a regulator that actually, well, it has a, a tricky track record. Actually, has a track record, um, and we want to use something they really understand. We don't want to design a reactor. We don't want to show them anything new. So we want to use these pre-certified reactors. So you know, there's a bunch of these, you know,、uh, SMR size light water reactors. Light water reactors being, you know, what powers the submarines and the aircraft carriers and almost every single、uh, commercial power plant in the world and every single one in the United States.、Um, we want to use this type, this reactor technology, and then we want to figure out how to build it very cheaply. And our approach is to basically centrally manufacture them in shipyards,、um, the entire power plant manufactured in the shipyard. Where you already have a pre-existing labor force, you already have the equipment. You don't have to go hire and train people and house people. They're already there. And maybe most importantly, with a shipyard, you know, once they build the first one, then they, the same people can build the second one, and they can actually get along the learning curve, which something nuclear just hasn't really embarked upon. It's more expensive to build nuclear now than it was 40 years ago, 20 years ago. You know, inflation adjusted. So, you know, we think that by using、uh, technology that people understand and that has been regulated, using centralized manufacturing and a process that you know can. Print out these multi-billion-dollar cruise ships and oil rigs in under two years. You have an opportunity to build something that can be regulated and can be much、uh, more cheaply built and much more efficiently built, which we think can radically reduce the cost. I love the idea of printing out nuclear reactors, putting them on ships, and then sending them around the world where they sit offshore to power progress on land. Blue Energy is treating reactors as just another hard thing to be built. And tapping into the expertise, skill, and talent in the shipbuilding industry to start lower down on the experience curve than they would if they started from scratch. And then the thesis goes: as these experienced shipbuilders build more and more nuclear reactors, the cost of each reactor will come down too. So one of the beautiful things about、uh, shipyard manufacturing is this is not a hypothetical technology, right? This is something. So、um, these shipyards are extremely. Efficient. They're extremely well run, and they know what their learning curves are, and they know them so well that they'll price those learning curves in, right? So if you want to go buy ten ships, they'll tell you, "Here's the first one, how much it'll cost. Here's the tenth one, how much it'll cost." And so by a tenth of a kind for a ship that has a similar complexity to、uh, the type of thing we're talking about, it's thirty five percent cheaper after the tenth one, right? That's、uh, a big deal when you're in the energy world and you're basically selling electricity, which is a commodity. But I think that's just the beginning, right? Like tenth of a kind is a, a place where a lot of nuclear power plants never get to that point, right? They build one and then they move on, and then maybe they'll build one in a totally different place with a totally different group of people, and it'll be even more expensive than the first one. But I think getting to a place where you're kind of printing these out, and within ten building ten of them, you're thirty five percent cheaper. You know, you continue that curve down by like the fiftieth one, you're like fifty percent. Like it, it, it gets much cheaper, much more quickly. And I think it's easy to be cynical about stuff like this、um, and think that you know, well. Nuclear power just is complicated and is expensive,、um, but it, historically that's simply not the case. You know, in the '50s and '60s, we were building nuclear power plants for、uh, you know $800 per kilowatt. You know, like radically cheaper. You know,、uh, like cheaper than coal, cheaper than almost any other energy source today.、Um, there's all sorts of reasons why maybe it got very expensive, and I think a lot of those were well-intended reasons.、Um, but it's not inherent to the technology, and I think that、um, tapping into a learning curve of any kind would radically help nuclear. We heard Matt's point loud and clear. It's not inevitable that nuclear will get cheaper if you simply start manufacturing it, but there's a lot of precedent to point to that says this should be possible. Brett Kulmas also came to nuclear after startup success, and he identified many of the same challenges and opportunities that Matt did. Nuclear isn't inherently expensive to build, and there's no reason it shouldn't be much cheaper than it is today. 
Last Energy is building SMRs based on standard pressurized water reactor designs, innovating not on the technology itself, but on the business side, the reactor size, who they sell to, and how they go to market. Okay, so what does a gigawatt coal plant cost, right? Let's say a billion dollars. What does a gigawatt nuclear plant cost? $10 billion. What is the difference functionally between a coal plant and a nuclear plant? If anything, a nuclear plant should be cheaper because you don't need all of the fuel handling equipment. You don't need all those coal yards. You don't need all the trains going to them, right? You can drive the fuel up on a truck. So if anything, a nuclear plant should be cheaper than a coal plant on a you know per megawatt basis. And yet it's 10 times as expensive. So where did all of that money get spent? Well, regulatory requirements. Yeah, so our thought was after studying this for two years and realizing that this was the problem, that there was not a technology problem, that it would have been fine if we just kept building, you know, my favorite two plants, Point Beach one and two, there's 1100 megawatts for you at less than $1,000 a kilowatt built in under three years, 1968 to 1971. So like in the ideal world, we're just building 10,000 of those everywhere where you need power plant all across the world, all across the grid, exactly like you see, 1968 technology. I got no problem with that. But how do we get from here to there? Because, you know, you still need to put together a lot of money to do that. And the people who have money aren't going to necessarily fund that idea or take the risk on that. And so our thought was go small and go to different regulatory environments where their paradigm is fundamentally different. So Brett founded Last Energy to build small and build in the UK, where differences of opinion after the Manhattan Project pushed the government to create its own independent nuclear industry and regulatory framework. Brett believes they'll be able to move more quickly through the regulatory process in the UK than the US. The trade he's making is to use standard reactor design in order to minimize time spent introducing regulators to a novel design which would likely run on the order of years and add uncertainty to the process. Plus, Brett believes the current reactor designs work great. We have many of them efficiently and safely humming along in the US and globally, so why change anything? We pride ourselves on being the least innovative nuclear company out there. We focus on innovation around manufacturability and not around nuclear technology. So we won't touch the core physics, chemistry, you know, as much as people like to say these 19, you know, because there were like 50 different types of reactors built, as much as people like to say that they're, you know, proven because the National Labs built them once, no way. You got to operate something for 30 years before you begin to like see what like random corrosion issues happen, which bolts wobble loose on your pumps due to the frequency of how you arranged, you know, your pipe hangers. You know, you got to really have like, decades of expertise. And by the way, that affects your economics today because it affects the rate at which you can borrow construction capital, the operational performance into the future. So this is why you know, we decided to settle on just the standard PWR, shrink it down, design it for manufacturability. So how do we build 10,000 of something a year? That's what we think of even on our first power plant. Now, granted, there's going to be design improvements and iterations and continued design for manufacturability. But what I direct our engineering team to do is you're thinking about the big picture. You're thinking about high throughput manufacturing. Like that's how we need to make design trade-offs decisions. Thanks for listening so far. Hang on. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Are you a founder who spends far too much time on bookkeeping or taxes? Good news. We partnered with our friends at pilot.com so you never have to waste time on accounting again. How nice does that sound? Pilot is an accounting firm specifically built for the unique needs of startups. Pilot provides accounting, CFO, and tax services that are designed with flexibility and scalability in mind. As a founder, you have a million things going on. Sales, fundraising, product, hiring, and more. It's hard to find time to do it all. Pilot's team of full-time U.S.-based experts take care of accounting, bookkeeping, and taxes for you, giving you the time you need to lead your business. Whether you're just starting out as a team of two in a garage, or you've grown to a multi-hundred person team, Pilot will support you at every stage of the journey. Jeff Bezos famously said, focus on the things that make your beer taste better, meaning focus on the specific areas that make your product better. For anything else, bring in the experts. You'll get higher quality work and you'll be able to focus on your own unique strengths. Speaking from experience here, accounting is the sort of thing that you really want done by an expert like Pilot. Expert accounting doesn't just save you time, it gives you the information you need to make better business decisions. And Pilot truly are experts. They're the largest startup-focused accounting firm in the US, 
and they've worked with thousands of startups, including companies like OpenAI, ScaleAI, and Airtable, scaling with them from pre-seed to Series C and beyond. To get 20% off your accounting bill for the first six months, go to pilot.com slash packy. That's pilot.com slash packy. One of the things I've noticed talking to nuclear startups and hard tech startups more broadly is how important it is to have a strong strategy from the beginning. There's something about needing to spend a lot of money on CapEx early that really makes you think twice about where you're heading. Plus, as A16Z American Dynamism partner Catherine Boyle explained, the dynamics in these hard tech categories are just different. One of the things that I think is actually unique about this category, and especially with American Dynamism companies that we talk about all the time, is that these are often terrible categories with one extraordinary winner or a handful of extraordinary winners. Like the power laws are so much more pronounced. Part of that is because of the regulatory aspect, where once you can get through the regulatory hurdle, you have a much deeper moat. If you compound that with manufacturing, hardware, physical moats that are built with these companies. That's why you see something like a SpaceX, which is you know the most valuable private company in the US. But when you look at sort of where the next, say, 10 aerospace companies are, there's just such a larger delta between the winners and the ones who are runners up, which is not true of cybersecurity or of you know typical SaaS investing. Like there's many, many more winners where the gains are distributed across many. So this just looks like a very different category. When we talk about nuclear as a whole or defense as a whole or aerospace as a whole, like these are categories where you really do have to be in the top handful of companies and work with those companies and, and, and they become extraordinary outcomes. Getting the strategy right is critical. My favorite strategy book is Richard Rummelt's Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. In it, he writes that a good strategy has three parts. One, diagnosis. It names or classifies the situation, linking facts into patterns and suggesting more attention be paid to some issues and less to others. Two, the guiding policy, which outlines an overall approach for overcoming the obstacles highlighted by the diagnosis. And three, coherent actions. The resource deployments, policies, and maneuvers that are undertaken should be consistent and coordinated. The coordination of action provides the most basic source of leverage or advantage available in strategy. Done right, strategy is based on a realistic assessment of the challenges and opportunities, a general direction about what's important. From there, companies can make better decisions about which specific actions to take. A good strategy doesn't guarantee success, but it gives a company the best shot. Talking to Matt and Brett, and to the founders you'll hear from in the next episode, made my strategy nerd soul happy. Let's dive in now on Blue Energy and Last Energy and on where they look similar in um, what they're trying to do here with building out their SMR facilities. Both companies believe that manufacturing uh, and doing things repeatedly in high volumes is going to bring them down the experience curve. Uh, but they each have a different approach to that. So we have Blue Energy looking at using shipyards as the place to go for their manufacturing. And these are places where uh, you have an experienced workforce that has been building ships for many, many years repeatedly um, and has a lot of similar processes that go into that manufacturing. Uh, and they are doing more of a integrator partnership approach here. Whereas Last Energy is going to stand up their own manufacturing facilities to uh, manufacture their SMRs. And what you have here is Blue Energy operating as an integrator obviously needs to be in partnership with another organization, uh, these shipyard builders, for example. And Last Energy, since they're standing up something themselves and vertically integrating that entirely, uh, is able to have a lot more control. That said, Blue Energy gets to go in, move a lot faster since they're integrating with someone else, and also benefit from the experience of those, those shipbuilders, right? And so I think there's, it's interesting to see the, the pros and cons, the different type of approach towards how they want to set up their manufacturing. It's so interesting, and this is what I love about picking apart the kind of like interlinked decisions that companies make, because Blue Energy is trying to build 100 megawatt reactors, and Last Energy is building, I think, 20 megawatt reactors. I can't imagine, you know, it's like amazing to me that Last Energy is even standing up their own manufacturing facilities to do this. But like, I can't imagine the alternative for Blue Energy where they're like, you know what, we're going to take some VC money and we're going to go out and we're going to stand up shipyards that can produce these like five times as large reactors. So everything is linked. I think you're you're absolutely right. Like, it'd be nice to have access to a shipyard that's all yours in the workforce and it's all part of your team. And maybe down the line they grow and they can do acquisitions or vertically integrate in another in another way. But uh, you almost have to give up, I guess, some of that control if you want to go larger. And so it's just fun to see how all those different pieces kind of fit together in the company's strategies. 
Blue Energy and Last Energy are also thinking a little bit differently about how they're going to sell their power ultimately to uh, an end user. And so Blue Energy, especially because they're building these bigger SMRs, um, is thinking, let's sell these right into the grid for you know a state like California or a country like Poland and um, set up power purchase agreements where there's a long-term agreement about what price is paid for that electricity over a long period of time. Last Energy, on the other hand, is thinking, how do we go after the industrial market in particular? Because again, 20 megawatts is a great size for that industry and actually sell to them what they call behind the meter. So um, directly to those businesses instead of going through the grid. This is why the strategy stuff is so fun. Like once you start looking at these companies, even though they're these crazy nuclear companies that are manufacturing reactors, you still start to see that like all these decisions influence each other, right? Like if you're going big, you should sell into the grid. And there's a lot of decisions in terms of how your business model works that way. I would imagine that even changes the sales team that you set up and who you hire and all those different pieces. Whereas if you're last energy, you're selling to, to your point, industrials, or actually, I think one of the interesting ones is, is Microsoft, right? Like they just announced that they're doing, they're going to power some of their data centers or they're at least exploring it using nuclear energy. And a 20 megawatt facility feels like a pretty good fit for something like that, that kind of data center is, as we talked about with Brett. Yeah, Microsoft's the big news right now, right? Actually, on our um, one of our early investors is the former chairman of the board of Microsoft, Dave Marquardt. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It's all integrated from diagnosis through guiding policy through coherent actions. Microsoft recently announced that it was hiring someone to, quote, implement global small modular reactor and micro reactor strategies to power data centers. It and others are going to need a lot of power to run energy intensive data centers to keep up with the growing demand for AI. Those data centers need a lot of power, but they don't need a gigawatt. In addition to being easier to manufacture, Last Energy's 20 megawatt reactors are also well sized to meet the needs of large data centers and industrial sites. It's a match that seems to be made in heaven. Brett told us that the company has already signed eight contracts representing 51 20 megawatt power plants to date also under a PPA structure. Given the capital intensity of manufacturing anything, let alone nuclear reactors, the strategy doesn't end there. It extends to financing. One of my favorite things to jam on with nuclear entrepreneurs is how they think about financing their businesses. Venture capital is great for a lot of things, but it can be an awkward fit for nuclear. Josh Wolf told us that Lux looked at SMRs, but that they didn't make sense for his venture fund at the time. So what about these small modular reactors? Could you build 100 100 megawatt reactors that are much cheaper and just add them on as you need electricity. And that seemed like a good idea. We probably saw about six or seven different schemes, some of which are being commercialized today. We did not fund them because we thought it was too long, too much bureaucracy, too much regulatory framework. You had this weird chicken and the egg problem with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It would basically say, well, we're only going to help sponsor something if there's a customer. And a customer would say, well, we're only going to know if you are going to have approval that we're actually going to put money in. So there was this chicken and egg problem that created this paradox that created inertia and you never saw anything really fun there. The beauty of entrepreneurship, though, is that founders can study the issues that prior attempts faced and design around them. Plus, as we talked about earlier, both Brett and Matt had founding experience under their belts by the time they came to nuclear. So they understood what VCs would finance and what they wouldn't. Financing a nuclear reactor startup is a challenge, but it's solvable. Matt told us about the different funding alternatives available. There's the literal funding of the company, which is you know uh, done through equity, like like any uh, startup might, um, which is to fund the team and the design and basically the development of this platform. And then there's the literal plants themselves, right? And there's a couple different ways to do that. You know, there's some like one thing that SpaceX did I think was amazing is they built the rockets on their own balance sheet. Like, wow, that's a you know if you can raise that much money and you can do that, lets you move so much more quickly. That's amazing. If we wanted to uh, get to a point where we were doing regular project financing, it's up to us basically to make it as cookie cutter for that, for those folks as possible. And I do think that that's how most you know energy products get built, as they get built um, with project financing, which is you know primarily debt. And there's good reason to believe that that would be done on like a project by project basis. And you know that, that that's also part of you know what makes energy more complicated than software is you know you know, you've got something great, you got to align the capital each time you want to deploy it, and that can be a challenge. Brett thinks about funding Last Energy in a similar way. Yeah, so let's differentiate between two different types of equity. So there's corporate equity, and that's what most people think of, like let's say from the VC community. So this is where you sell part of your company, your top level company, 
and everything along with it, all of your IP. And okay, so that's where you sell that to an investor for some amount of money, some percentage for some amount of money. And that's you raising money for the company. And then you use that those proceeds to grow value for all the all the shareholders. So that's corporate equity. Then you have project equity. And sometimes people call this project finance, and sometimes people call this project debt, or some combination of project debt and equity under project finance. Project finance is where you would set up an SPV, a special purpose vehicle, and you're putting certain assets in that vehicle, in that corporate entity, but that corporate entity is wholly owned or subsidiary or joint venture of your corporate entity. And that SPV, now you can sell off shares to that to different people. So that's still equity, but a different type of equity, and it's non-dilutive to Topco. So from that perspective, yes, you can sell equity, but and that's what we are doing, but we're selling equity in the power plant corporate entity, in the physical asset, in the real asset itself. To Josh's point, funding a nuclear startup purely with venture capital doesn't make sense. So both Brett and Matt are planning to use a mix of VC dollars to fund the company, and project financing to fund the projects. And each is taking different approaches to the challenges that Josh laid out. Last Energy, for example, is focusing its efforts in the UK, where regulation is somewhat less burdensome, and pre-signing customers in order to both smooth the regulatory process and make the projects financeable. It's much easier to ask the capital markets to fund a project when there's a signed contract with long-term guaranteed cash flows on the other side. Blue Energy made trade-offs explicitly designed to ease the burden of working with the NRC using a design they're already comfortable with, and a manufacturing approach that they believe will make all the approvals after the first go much more smoothly. He explained by walking us through his thought process on how long it should take to manufacture each reactor. Let's go backwards. Okay, in order to start building it, you need a a construction license from the NRC. Okay, so that's going to take basically a minimum of two years. And again, like optimistically, that could take two years. We're not designing a new reactor. We're not showing them a technology they don't understand. We're taking a reactor that they've already looked at, a technology they've already looked at, and we're putting it in new packaging, so to speak. And we could be blissfully surprised or we could be you know, disappointed by that process. But I think you know, two years would be, I think, on the optimistic side of realistic. And then I think to get to that point, I think people think, oh, you just sent to the NRC. It's like, no, probably you need about you know, two years minimum of work to you know, find a site, um, do the work that you need to do on that site. There's a lot of work that has to happen in order to uh, submit that application. You can't just submit an application with an idea. You need a concrete proposal. The, the license is given to a particular site, not to a design. In a sort of uh, really great case, you could be looking at something in six years. And again, these are not technically constrained problems. These are people problems and bureaucracy problems. And I don't mean that in a cynical way. I just mean, literally, it's about working with people to collaborate, to get certain things done, to get certain approvals, to be allowed to do things. The interesting thing, and I think what makes me really excited is whether the first one is in six years or seven years or eight years, and I'm optimistic that it can be closer to six, you now have a a fully baked supply chain to start printing these things out, right? And that to me is like the really exciting thing. This is not, we built one, oh my God, you have to go through that whole process all over again to build a second. It's like, no, no, no. Like now we have a shipyard with a staff that knows how to make these things, they can make a second one. We have the, you know, regulator has seen this exact design come through with all the questions they've already asked. Venture capitalists typically operate funds with a 10-year life cycle, which means that they have to return money to their investors, limited partners, within 10 years. That means for a startup to be successful on a VC's portfolio, it needs to go public or get acquired roughly within 10 years. So the bet on Blue Energy from a VC perspective is that the company will get its first reactor out the door, generating power, and have both the PPAs for future reactors and a clear path to much faster rollouts going forward within those 10 years. All of the hardest work will have been done, and the company would be one that the public markets would be willing to invest in. Oaklo, a nuclear startup that was founded in 2013, recently announced that it's going public via SPAC, co-led by Sam Altman, exactly a decade after its founding. You'll hear a lot more from its co-founder and CEO, Jake DeWitt, in the next episode, but we'll introduce you to him quickly here. He told us that there are real advantages to being public, chiefly that it helps with project financing the company's plans through the PPAs it's signed. And then he's been pleasantly surprised by public market investors' appetite for and familiarity with nuclear. I have found an incredible amount of familiarity, of savviness, of depth of understanding, nuanced understanding in the public investor markets. It's been awesome. And I think that's a really good sign for the industry as a whole. 
because one, it's supporting the fact that it takes a lot of demand. And I would argue there's probably more demand than there is actual peer exposure in the public markets, which is good. And also, I think that helps pull, obviously, and support in the private markets, which is great throughout the whole pipeline. And I think that's really a positive here. It's also important because I think investors are increasingly seeing that there's differentiation, that not all nuclear things are going to look the same. Uh, they can look different. They can take different approaches and they're getting smart across the board on those things. So, you know, think about what's sort of in the public domain now. You've got a small light water reactor. You've got a small gas cooled reactor. And any of us is a small liquid metal fast reactor. Like, it's kind of cool to see that exposure. So you're seeing investors getting pretty smart on this stuff. And I think that's going to carry through. I also think it creates a good signal then on the venture side of things, which I think is really important for just sustaining the pipelines. I have to say the reception and uptake has been, I mean, just to put it, I guess, clearly and plainly, it's exceeded our expectations and we were obviously already pretty pretty optimistic. I think one of the hard things here, all of us are meaningfully pre-revenue for a while and most nuclear companies are going to be like that for a bit. But that, you know, investors understand what that means and they know how to look at the risk from that. And they're seeing that there's several ways you can understand how the how milestones come together and how progress gets made, which I think is awesome because then that supports sort of what that roadmap looks like. And then that kind of allows you to, to focus, iterate and, and communicate accordingly. What Jake said about public market awareness creating more support in the private markets is really important. The same day we spoke to Jake, I'd spoken to a pre-seed nuclear founder who cited Oaklo as an example of a company that would generate most of its revenue and impact after its first decade, but they could get its investors liquidity within that 10-year window. The more examples there are like Oaklo, the easier it should be for new nuclear startups to raise venture capital. 10 years isn't a hard and fast rule. Many VC agreements with their LPs give them an option to extend the fund life by a couple years, often multiple times. And no one realistically is gonna get mad if you have a 100X company in your portfolio that's gonna take a couple more years to get liquid. But it's helpful for investors to see that big outcomes are possible within around that decade timeline. Investors are tempted by the sheer size of the opportunity on the other side of commercialization. Global energy markets are in the four to six trillion dollar range annually, practically limitless. And energy has this useful feature that the cheaper it gets and the more we produce, the more people use it. Zooming in, operational reactors can be a great business once they're up and running. Blue Energy plans to manufacture 100 megawatt reactors. Let's do a little bit of back of the envelope math around that. So let's start by assuming a capacity factor of 90%, which is actually slightly lower than what we see in the US today, which means that the plants would run 90% of available hours in a year, or 7,844 hours. That's 784.4 gigawatt hours of electricity, or converting that to megawatts, 784,400 megawatt hours. At a rough wholesale electricity price estimate of $40 a megawatt hour, you're looking at $31 million in revenue from the reactor each year. And these things can run for decades. And Matt isn't just thinking about making one reactor. He wants to print out hundreds. The way we think of it is these shipyards in South Korea, which are the ones that we're talking to, they make something on the order of 50 of these big ships a year. So that's about four, this is each of these shipyards. This is about four a month. And in terms of the complexity and steel tonnage of what we're describing, it's similar to like one of those ships. So there's no reason why a single shipyard, even working at 25% capacity for us, couldn't be doing one reactor per month. And in our case, these are small modular reactors. So think about the order of 100 uh, megawatts. But that's, you know, over a gig a year. And, you know, you project that out to, you know, 2038, you're at like six gigs, which is, you know, a lot of ARR for us, but, you know, not a hugely meaningful amount of energy for the world. If you take that same shipyard and like, there's such a demand for this as we think there will be when you actually can deliver secure, clean, reliable power on demand, and you took over that whole shipyard. So instead of 25% capacity, you were at 100% capacity. Okay, now by 2038, you're at around 35 gigawatts. And that's about, you know, $25 billion of energy demand. If you're adding, you know, from the date that we make our first one, if you're adding a new shipyard at 100% capacity every year because this is just flying off the shelves, very quickly you're at well over 150 gigawatts of energy, you know, in the next 15 years. And like, look, like we could end up anywhere in that range, and you know, there's a lot of things to be determined. But the whole point of the design and the reason why I think this is exciting is that there is a world where you can ramp up, and you know, there's 200 plus shipyards globally of this size that I'm describing. A lot has to go right for blue energy to get to 150 gigawatts of energy. If they get there, that's $100 billion per year in what is essentially annual recurring revenue. That seems crazy. And we're not saying that it's anywhere close to guaranteed, 
But the energy markets really are that large. Of the 10 largest companies in the world by revenue, seven are energy companies. Of the top 25, 13 are energy companies. We spent a bunch of time talking about how these businesses are financed because we think it's really important, maybe as important as the reactor design or manufacturing process. One of the main reasons nuclear has struggled is because, as Matt put it, it's a terrible business. But there's nothing inherently terrible about it. Uranium is as energy-dense a fuel source as exists on planet Earth. Regulation is a real issue, but entrepreneurs view it as a part of the diagnosis to be designed around, not a non-starter. And nuclear reactors, Matt, Brett, and Isaiah believe, can be manufactured as cheaply as any other big, complex machine if we start treating them like regular, big, complex machines. That leaves financing as an enormous risk. Will these companies be able to get the funding, both venture and project financing, that they need to stay alive long enough to ride down that experience curve? Josh Wolf told us that to be successful, nuclear needs to tap into the two emotions that motivate people, fear and greed. The greed aspect is you just need typically one story for people to rally around, one narrative of success. That could be a public company, uh, it could be somebody that made an investment in uh, existing utility, like uh, Exelon Chicago or somebody that is just seeing runaway success, that suddenly people galvanize around. And that's the beautiful thing about markets. You know, somebody, whether they want to leave a legacy, whether they truly believe in it, whether they think that they're going to make a fortune, even if it's a, you know, sub 1% or one basis point probability that this will work. But my gosh, the magnitude, if this does, is so enormous that it, again, it appeals to that, that vector of greed. When it comes to manufacturing more nuclear capacity, in the immortal words of Gordon Gecko, greed is good. Trillion dollar markets are up for grabs in the energy transition. I think we need to rebrand the energy transition, it sounds a little corporate and boring, to the electronissance, by the way. All right, I dig it. Trillion dollar markets now up for grabs in the electronissance then. And the capitalist bet here is that with a big enough prize at stake, entrepreneurs will figure out ways to work through all of the issues we discussed in episodes two and three. That the best way to decarbonize isn't through degrowth or even government intervention, but through good old-fashioned capitalism. That was one of the most interesting things to me in these conversations. I've been so worked up about regulation as an outsider, someone who doesn't have to actually deal with the NRC. And the founder's response has essentially been, it is what it is, we'll play the game on the field. Obviously, I think they'd all be happier if the regulatory process was smoother. They're signing themselves up for years and years of paperwork and meetings and delays. And there's no question that we would be able to decarbonize more quickly and get more energy on the grid more quickly if the NRC adopted a more pragmatic stance. But the incentives here, both to make an impact and the financial incentives, are so strong that the right kind of people, often second-time founders who have the resources and experience to take big swings, are willing to go through the pain for even that 1% shot at making it out the other side. There's this great quote from Thoreau that trade and commerce seem to be made of rubber because they always manage to bounce over the obstacles which legislators are continually putting in their way. That one seems apt here. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm optimistic around this category of startups, these these blue energies of the world, the last energies that are saying, nope, we're not going to innovate on design. We're going to focus on manufacturability. And then we're going to go to market with this new power purchase agreement model. I think there's a lot of potential for that. And I think like solar, going small, improving manufacturing might not feel like it's going to have this big impact the way that gigascale reactors do. But I think that we'll see that this will pay off. They will come down the experience curve and, and the productivity learning curve. And uh, I think that means in the end, we'll wake up in 10 years, 15 years to just dozens of gigawatts of new nuclear capacity being produced every month. On the next episode, we have five more startups for you. We're going to go even more sci-fi and talk to founders who are building advanced reactors using different fuels and coolants, serving end markets like the military, the global hydrocarbon market, and even the moon. Thanks for listening and see you next week on the next episode of Age of Miracles. Thank you for listening and watching to this episode of Age of Miracles. If you like what you hear, please rate, subscribe, and share. And if you're feeling really generous, tell us what you think in the comments. Plus, we have a ton of resources and references in our resource hub if you want to go deeper. And we've linked them all in the show notes below. See you next week.